Happy birthday, Dad. Well, that's kind of what this Bibliomaniac documentary is. Uh, this has been released on the 18th of April, and that would have been my dad's 94th birthday. But unfortunately, two weeks before his 93rd birthday, he died. And shortly after he died, I wanted to make something that celebrated his life, and there were a few things that he loved more than the books that surrounded him. He was as much a bibliomaniac as I have ever been. So in way of making a kind of ritual and a ceremony, I did a show in my local bookshop with just stacks of his books and just improvised around the tales that were within those books and within the little bits of marginalia and indeed the stories of his life. And uh, also in this film, I wander around the house. Again, this was about, I think we filmed this about two or three weeks uh, after he died. And uh, also you're gonna see a little bit of the eulogy in the, uh, in the church on the day of his funeral. But this is a celebration of him. It's a celebration of all readers and of all book lovers. I hope you enjoy this very special episode of Bibliomaniac. My dad died, it was, uh, it's nearly six weeks ago now, and books were such an important part of his life. And I think that ritual and ceremony is quite an important thing to have. And so I wanted to turn this, I was thinking, he made me into the kind of bookish person that I am. Uh, he made both my sisters also into, I'm gonna, I'll explain a little bit about the kind of why we are the people that we are. In, in one way, I'm glad he can't be here because the last time that he came to, I think anything outside, I hope I'm right, so was he came to the Chorleywood Bookshop when I, I, I launched Bibliomaniac. And uh, he, uh, he, he was sat in the front row and uh, the owner of the bookshop did a lovely little speech right at the beginning and said, oh, and by the way, uh, Robin has just won the author of the year from the Bookseller Association. And he just went very loudly, I don't know why. And uh, so, so glad he's not there. And, uh, and it was, uh, I don't know why he did it. He did it, I'll explain later on as well about that thing. I think a lot of people, one of the things that we can find very, very difficult to express sometimes, I think it's also, it's very much an English malaise. Sometimes love is one of the hardest things to express it's much easier to express so sometimes it gets turned into banter and things like that but as you will find out throughout the rest of uh, the evening we expressed a lot of that through books and what I've got here these are just some of his books right he had hundreds and hundreds of books I've got some of his letters as well I'm going to go through his love of books some of my mum's love of books as well and just talk about his kind of life in books this is the first room that I've dealt with in so if anyone's ever wondered where I get my bibliomania from. Uh, it this is this is one of my dad's rooms. This is not more books that are in and in fact, but it may even be I think far fewer books than in a lot of his other rooms. Um, my dad died on Sunday, and the first th it's something actually that my sister and I have talked about a lot. Uh, I've got two sisters, right? my other sisters here at the moment as well. Uh, but my sister who lives in the UK and me, we for the, about the last ten years, we've often said, "Oh my God, what are we going to do?" with all dad's stuff when he dies. We, that will be literally be the end of our life. It'll be like kind of Steptoe and some, that the death of the, the patriarch, then you still tied to it. So this is, the wall over there was all full of books. And we've already taken a car full of books, an entire car full of books to Oxfam Berkhamsted. I would very often, from the age of about eight years old, I would go off and I would go to, to, to book fairs with him up in London and in Cookham. See, this is the thing. My dad was you know, exactly the same as I am now. Is There's no real pattern in his book buying. He needed Eric Gill's masterpieces of wood engraving. The less said about Eric Gill, the better. Why Ariel is still at the front of the BBC, I don't know. Uh, and then he needed public schools and the Great War. Uh, and he needed Thomas Buick and his graphic worlds. This is my dad, uh, he became an actor. And uh, for a short amount of time, for a couple of years, he was in rep. He loved that kind of thing. In fact, I've got a few of his books that he loved. This is, in fact, I got him, he, he loved meeting Brian Blessed. I did a radio show with Brian Blessed and, uh, and dad just came and sat in the corner because that is your only choice when you meet Brian Blessed. Uh, everyone's, and, and then Brian, so I, I got him to sign his book later on. I just loved it. To Nigel! Go for it, Brian Blessed. He was 89 at the time. He was trying to say, come on, Nigel, you little bastard. You might be 89, but you can still go up the Matterhorn, right? So 
there, that's jo Joan Littlewood, uh, Dreams and Reality. Of course, Joan Littlewood from Stratford East, such an incredibly important part of post-war theatre. And my dad was briefly, uh, he was uh, an actor, an acting stage manager in these kind of um, rep companies that would go around, from, uh, Salisbury and High Wycombe and all of these places. Um, when you were in London uh, as an actor, if you didn't have anywhere to sleep, Joe Littlewood would just let you sleep in the kind of Stratford East, like, you know, in the attic, in the theatre, wherever. This was another one that he loved, Exit Through the Fireplace, which is a bunch of rep actors talking about their experience of, you know, for instance, uh, Exit Through the Fireplace, it is called that because at one point, neither door opened when the detective was meant to be leaving. So he had to climb just up into the pretend chimney. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving via the fireplace. What's that clue mean, right? So, Because my mum and dad lived in the same house for so long, if you move, when you move, you go, bloody hell, we've got too much stuff. But if you don't move between 1964 and 2023, it's only your children that go, bloody hell, they had too much stuff. Does anyone here remember the cottage bookshop in Penn, just outside High Wycombe? I don't know if any of you went there, but if you didn't, I can tell you it was also the inspiration for uh, L Space. Terry Pratchett's L Space was inspired by this incredible bookshop. It was a cottage and every single room of the cottage was just filled with books. And then there was an attic. There was a secret attic that only regulars were allowed to go to, right? The trustworthy people. They, they, the old man who ran it would unlock the door, you would go inside and then he would lock the door behind you. And inside that room were the most expensive books. Some of them were three, four or five pounds. And uh, my dad would wander around and I'd kind of look at all of these things way out of my pocket money range. And, uh, and then one time when we went back there, the attic was no longer available. And my dad said, oh, is the attic, do you not use that anymore? And he went, oh, I've just realized that I'm getting old, that's all. And the distance between the counter and the door is now a little bit further for me actually to be able to hear when people are knocking to get out. And, um, <laughs> I discovered that when I went up to the room one day and found out that all the vases were filled with urine. So, um... <laughs> I'm going to start off with actually his life, right? This is a thing that, again, I often talk about when I do the Bibliomaniac talks. I think it's really important to write. Even if you don't want to be an author, or you don't want to be a poet or whatever, write things down. Leave things behind. You know, all of these books around it. And so this, my dad, Sarah, uh, one of my sisters, she said, I, I want to know more about your life. Write down some of your life. So he wrote this down. And again, it doesn't matter how big the audience is or anything like that. That's not the important bit. This is the opening of his My Life. This is... Uh, uh, Ince, on Good Friday, April 18th, 1930, at Woking to Angela and Norman Ince of Hallland, Slinfold, Sussex, the gift of a son, open brackets, Nigel, close brackets. And so that was, as he says, thus was my arrival announced to the world in the week following Easter in the Times at the cost of one guinea, the equivalent of one pound five pence, a substantial amount at a time when secretaries with shorthand and typing were earning four pounds a week and a two bedroom flat in West Kensington fetched the same amount. I was born in the home woking at 8.45 p.m. and Dr. Thorne telephoned my father with the news that I had arrived weighing seven pounds six ounces and that the baby is a big one with a very big head. So this is, this is a, there's so many. My dad loved photography and he was also there. I, I, reckon, I reckon he might have been 12 then, 11 or 12. Anyone know SPV Mace? No, this is a great thing, right? SPV Mace wrote an enormous number of books. SPV Mace was someone who was obviously almost perpetually in debt because you get a, he was a good writer, but you know when you go, that's too many books. And, uh, and he used to teach my dad. And uh, so he loved getting these books. And actually it turns out that this copy was sold to my dad by his teacher. And so I love the idea of a teacher who in the 1940s had a merch stall outside. <laughs> Just go, by the way, lads, I've got a few books. There's a shilling off today. This one here, there, of my mum's little girl, there, with uh, some kittens. And it always reminds me of a conversation I had with Alan Moore, where we were talking about photographs, we were talking about mortality, and he talked about the first time that he was looking at some old photos, and as he looked in their eyes and he looked in their faces, he thought, I wonder if they know they're dead. And I find that, again, that kind of, 
as I've often talked about the fact that, you know, Brian Cox, if I say, do ghosts exist? You go, no, they don't. They break the second law of thermodynamics. But I think, you know, the, the, this is where ghosts exist. Ghosts exist when you go around, when you look at all these old photos and you see all these moments in time that are captured in that kind of sense of the block universe. One, one of the sections of books that he really loved and was really inspired by and fascinated by were books about the First World War. So he loved reading the novels of Pat Barker and he loved reading non-fiction books as well because his father had fought throughout the First World War, indeed also with his two uncles as well. Somewhere here, I haven't found them yet, but all of his dad's letters from the Western Front, etc. Uh, he had all of those and he transcribed all of those. And so he was always fast. So we've got things there like um, Anthem for Damned, Doomed Youth, rather, which is uh, a collection of First World War poetry. So obviously that's a kind of book to keep. And we're very, very lucky as a family because we have left behind. He made sure that all of those letters were transcribed. And again, none of us None of Sarah, Camilla and myself, we never knew our granddad. He died before we were born, but we're able to get a sense of that person. And, uh, and my niece Francesca as well found out more. Again, one of the things that I find beautiful about going through these books and going through these diaries and the memoirs and all of these little bits and pieces is sometimes you find out the effect that people that you never even met have had on turning you into the human being that you are. Bruce Chatwin. And again, I, it shows the kind of diversity of things that, that my dad was, was into, that he also, he was drawn to the, the song lines by Bruce Chatwin and there's Uts by Bruce Chatwin. And uh, there's more Bruce Chatwin down there. I mean, I think that was the thing. Again, it's a, it's a, a thing I think all the family have kind of inherited. It's just like, you, you can't stop being fascinated in things. So, so you, you find out about a certain kind of author and uh, and suddenly, like the Karen Blixen, he loved, this is Out of Africa, one of the versions, obviously turned into a film with Robert Redford and Meryl Streep. That sense of the idea of respecting people, of honesty, like my dad, he really couldn't understand the last 10 years of politics. He couldn't understand the duplicity. Sometimes it's hard to work out what to get rid of, and uh, sometimes it's not so hard. Will I be keeping my dad's uh, Daily Telegraph complete collection of Margaret Thatcher? He couldn't understand. You know, one of the reasons that he, he retired as soon as he could, he said, was because you could no longer trust someone on the shaking of the hand. And that for him was an important thing. If you said you were going to do something, you were going to do something. I know also my friend Trent, who I do a lot of work with, who's, who's, who's filming tonight. That's one of the reasons that we work together so much is because I trust Trent and I think he trusts me and we always, and I think it's uh, to know that that influence of my grandfather who I never knew runs through us as if it was a sequence of genes is to me something fabulous to have this and, and to read of his experience. This is, um, so this is one of his letters. This is, I'll give you the background. My dad put in the history of what was going on at the time. On the 23rd of July, the 21st Brigade attacked the village of Guillemont, which according to Little Hart in the history of the First World War became a shambles of horror. The way to it from Trones Wood was down a slope and up another slope, now only a few yards of farm road, but then it seemed an infinite distance. My dad would love visiting all the sites of where those trenches were and finding out this thing that sometimes when we see films about those battles, we see enormous spaces, but actually what was being fought over were tiny spaces. And then on the next letter, he wrote the 25th of July, 1916, the news for to you today is bad. The battalion went into an attack the day before yesterday and were very badly knocked about. In fact, very little of our regiment is left. Only seven officers came out untouched. Four we know of are wounded in our own hospitals. Poor Bernard is missing. It is known that he was wounded, and I fear that we may never see him again. This power of words that are not words that were published. This is, this is again, in fact, why statues. I always think there's too many statues of generals and politicians and dukes and not enough statues of the teachers and the librarians and all of those other people that really, again, turn us into the people that we may hopefully become. I'm also making a little collection of books for friends of mine because uh, it's a nice thing with books to pass them on. This, this was actually one of the final, uh, in fact, the last bit of post that I opened for my dad, the last day that he was still here in this house uh, was typically, what well, one was a, a, a lovely card from Guide Dogs for the Blind about how much money has so far been raised uh, in memory of my mum. 
And the other one was from the man who runs Fleece Press. Just a little uh, note there to thank my dad for his custom. And, uh, and it was, it's, it's nice that the last bit of post that I opened for him was, again, something bookish. So much of his post was bookish. This, this, this book here is the, uh, the last book that my dad bought. I'm pretty certain no books arrived after this. It's from a lovely publisher called The Fleece Press. And it's uh, David Gentleman Stamps, 103 Not Out. And he was so proud of this book. When, when my dad got a book that he really loved, that joy of saying, oh, Robin, have I shown you? Oh, have I shown you that yet? It's very good. And this is this, uh, so David Gentleman, an artist who also designed a lot of stamps. And what the Fleece Press did was they had to wait a long time. So he ordered this book years ago, I think, because he wanted it to exist. But it couldn't exist until the Fleece Press had found enough stamps for, because uh, these are all unfranked stamps. So they had to collect every single one so that each version of this book has 103 unfranked stamps, all designed by David Gentleman. So he absolutely has the T you see there, and that's uh, Prince Charles. Don't know what happened to him. And, uh, and then this is the book that was put down, the last book that he was reading. Um, before he went into hospital and this was a book he didn't know he had and we started talking about it and I said oh, I'm just going to check and uh, and I found out I know where I'm going which in some ways sounds you know in, in its own way I know where I'm going seems to be the right book to read uh, as your final book and this was his favorite film he absolutely loved I know where I'm going it's a Powell and Pressburger film and uh, and I remember us watching the, a, a wonderful film historian called Mark Cousins and uh, fortunately, my friend uh, Lee Randall uh, knew him or knows Mark Cousins because I found out he'd made this documentary that my dad was desperate to see. And he couldn't find any version of the DVD that had this documentary. And Mark Cousins, very kindly, when my dad wasn't that well a few years ago, uh, I wrote an email to him and he put it straight in the post. And we had a night watching that documentary. And uh, so there we go. He'd, uh, he'd got up to page 15. F.W. Murnau, Sunrise and The Archers. And The Archers there, by the way, for those who don't know, it's not the radio show, The Archers. The Archers was what Paola Pressburger's production company was called, and F.W. Murnau, Sunrise is, of course, considered to be a, a, a true classic of 1920s cinema. We've got so many books to get through, and uh, I don't know how I'm going to get rid of them all. So, yeah, these are going to go to Johnny Maines, who I did the dead funny books with. That's short stories from The Strand, crime stories from The Strand. This is, uh, what have I got here? That's a, a, just a little leaflet about s some stones. So I thought Stuart Lee would probably like that. Oh yeah, it's just, oh, oh it's a pamphlet. I love pamphlets, they're really great. So that's, uh, and also Trackwear House as well. A little, which I remember going to with my dad. I think at the, it's a Trackwear House where they have the uh, shirt which Charles I was beheaded in. They'd washed it by the way, it was, it was very clean. That's another thing that I love. I love finding things in books as well, that apart from the books themselves. When you open a book, in fact, I'll show you this one. This was uh, back in January with my dad. I, I, I thought we've got to start clearing things out just a little bit. And uh, so I started getting some books out and like, this, this one's no good anymore, is it? Oh yeah, it's an old reference book. We don't need that, we don't need this. And then I found this, Angelique and the King. Anyone know the Angelique books? Right, they were apparently very popular in the 50s and 60s. They're generally about Angelique, that's Angelique. She's a, a young blonde woman who, from what I can gather, more often than not, falls in love with an untrustworthy duke. And uh, it's very much that genre. And, uh, and so I, I found one of them before and I thought, well, Dad won't want this. This is not the kind of thing I wonder where it came from. And of course, the thing at the moment of going through his books as well is I have to check every single one. I can't just box them. I have to look just in case something's left behind, a newspaper cutting or an inscription. And in this one, I opened it and suddenly this could not become a book that went down to Oxfam because it says, my darling Pam, for 365 of the happiest days of my life, Nigel, August the 15th, 1960. That was their first wedding anniversary. That was their paper wedding anniversary. So that becomes something that cannot go because that has a history of love inside it. The Tower of London, a pictorial romance. This was, uh, Sarah and Camilla found this. Again, I've never seen it. There's so much stuff. This is a book he wrote when he was 17. Bird photography and some other, which I just love. 
that kind of, what kind of photography? Well, there will be some other photography, but at the point of doing this third page of the book, I'm not prepared to be nailed down on what other photography will be in it. He always loved uh, photography. And, uh, and somewhere in here, I think I've marked it. There we go, just there, picture of a moth as well that he'd taken. Uh, just different bits of advice. When chasing butterflies, watch your step. This again was one of those books that was always around when we were children. And it's by Dulcie Gray. And some of you, if you're a fan of Howard's Way, you might know Dulcie Gray because she was, she used to uh, uh, always act with uh, her husband. Um, and, uh, oh God, what's his name? What's his name? Dulcie Gray, I must say, must say Michael Dennison. Michael Dennison and Dulcie Gray. And they were in a lot of films in the 40s and 50s. And then they often played just an old couple together. And I think pretty certain Michael Dennison was in. And as well as writing this book, Butterflies uh, on My Mind, lovely, all just butterflies, she also used to write short stories that ended up in the pan book of horror stories that Herbert von Thal used to do. And I'd never realised that till one day I was looking. So she'd always, hello, I'm just a nice old lady. Oh, wonderful, let's all play croquet. And then I read one of her stories where, and then he squeezed the eyeball that was there in the box and felt the entrails. So sometimes when she felt the pressure of just playing someone lovely, she then had to kill, 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 and kill again. Uh, and send those stories to Herbert von Thal. Again, another thing that uh, we found, this is a scrapbook. This is a scrapbook of uh, Cheney's, which is the village where we were all brought up. And in fact, the house where I was born. Uh, I was born in that house, there was a snowstorm. And uh, so no, I couldn't get to the hospital. I was born in the house. It's also the house where my mother died. So it's a house that feels again, very dense with memory. I was born here on the 20th of February 1969 and on would it be the 1st of December 2016 I think in the next door room is where my mum died so there's all of this time here. Well in fact we had his funeral on, on his 93rd birthday and uh, I had found a copy of Penthouse from 1969 that was signed and uh, as far as I know it's the first time that the pulpit in St Michael's Church has had amongst the props of the person doing the eulogy a pornographic magazine. Of course also it was this, this is uh, his uh, Side pocket penthouse from 1960. <laughs> um, he absolutely loved the articles, he really did. Um, don't know if I should have shown that, but tell you, you won't believe what I'm editing out, to be quite honest. I don't know what anything is in here, it's terrible, this is. Um, I don't know what some of these, these magazines are. Let's see, that's the. Ah, uh, oh, this is. Uh, so, when I was in FHM, I didn't know my dad had this, right? Uh, this was, what year is this? I, I think I just turned 40. Um, yeah, May 2009, so 14 years ago. Um, here we are, right, so this is it. Uh, the Comedians, right? And at that point, I was considered by some of the mainstream media to be one. Don't know how that happened. Um, and I remember, so it starts off with, with Limmy there, uh, Dan Clark. Uh, here I am, uh, still, even though it's a fashion shoot, very much dressed as a librarian again, uh, perhaps from a Kingsley Amis novel. Um, and I remember when I was being interviewed, um, God, how funny that my dad went out and got this copy of FHM. My dad was not one of those people who would ever say, I love you, but that was never a problem. I think he probably sometimes told my sisters that he loved them, but he had that, you know, men in the family, but it was never, it was never hidden. Love wasn't hidden, it just wasn't words. And it was often actions. And in the last few years of his life, one of those actions for me was he could no longer get out of the house. And that's what, when I was going around bookshops, everywhere that I went, and it was very odd. Last week was the first time I had to talk about this in the past tense, right? Where I would always find a book that I thought he would be interested in, because he loves books as well, loved books as well. He, these books are all ones that I've bought. Most of them are ones that I've bought when I've been on tour, and then I come back and visit my dad first. And then I think also if I leave them here, uh, it will reduce the shock uh, for my wife. And so I was, so, uh, Carlisle, I think, was the last book that I bought from him, was at Bookends. And I found a book about Robert Donat, the wonderful actor. And I thought, I don't think Dad's got that. So I rang him up. It's an excuse to ring him every time. Dad, I found a book about Robert Donat by J.C. Truin. I don't think you've got it. It's from 1968. I don't think I have got that. Oh, well, thank you for thinking about me. I'll bring it home, right? So then I got that and a few other books. And then whenever I got home, I would bring, you know, kind of the five, six, seven books I'd found for him.
and I'll go, hello, Father. Hello. Would you like a cup of tea? Yes. Oh, you haven't brought me cake as well. Yes, I have. Oh, but I'm putting on such weight. Oh, for heaven's sake, Father, you're 92. Who cares? And uh, then this is how we spoke all the time. And, um, <laughs> And then I would say, I found you, uh, I found you these books, and here's that Robert Donat book. Oh, that's a very, very nice book, isn't it? It's a very nice book. I, I do like the, uh, yes, the, the illustrations are very good. There's a very good picture of uh, Ingrid Bergman as well. Yes, thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> but actually what that was, was I love you. I love you. That was actually being said. And then what I didn't also, and then my sister said, oh, that's your draw. Um, this is all the cuttings that he had um about me so um which uh because i've never been a great um self archivist um so this was the guardian 2010 october the 15th robin ince's bad book club on tour um what does that what do they say about five years ago stand up comedian and secularist campaigner oh, i'm a secularist campaigner that's good Learn from a comedy idiot. This is ridiculous. It's quite amazing, really. There's, uh, there's the, uh, the copy of uh, The New Statesman, which uh, I edited with Brian Cox, which, of course, mainly means I edited it because Brian didn't really have time and I thought it would be fun to do. There we are. In, in praise of stridency, Josie Long. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing this. And then on the final day of editing, one of my teeth fell out. So that was interesting. Um... David Attenborough interview. That was that again. This is an interesting one, which is uh, thinking of my dad's books. Which is so 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 we interviewed David Attenborough, which was a lovely thing to do. Obviously, huge uh, admirer uh, and and such a great inspiration. And then when we finished the interview, I just mentioned that my dad had one of the books that David Attenborough had done with the Folio Society um, on. I think it was Birds of Paradise. It might be something else. And his face just lit up. He was so. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad he's got that book. And, and he looked so pleased to be sharing, well, you know, the fact that someone else, it's that normal thing, you know, when you recommend a book to someone else and they love that book and they enjoy that book, it's such a beautiful thing. And it was beautiful to see in David Attenborough the excitement that he had uh, at knowing that someone else adored a thing that he had helped create. This is uh I have no dear robin you will be shortly be informed by the registry that you are one of the three students in the department amongst the first years who share the driver prize for particularly commendable work this session i don't remember doing any commendable work when i was at university the other two students are Jeanette allen and samantha watson uh this should be in you should be receipt of some 20 pounds in book tokens and 20 pounds in those days is the equivalent of seven million pounds now um there just a little copy of christmas carol uh there we go that was that was my dad's first book plate so i don't know where he'd have bought that from a shop and then you'd have been able to just add there the library of books and nigel v ince the v is for valentine that was his middle name but yeah, this is, uh, so the Mustard magazine was from, and I think this is the first place, the incomplete map of the cosmic genome, which then kind of really became cosmic shambles. Um, we've still got all the incomplete map of the cosmic genome footage somewhere. It's really good fun to do. Well, generally, the novelty of these things, that's a nice novelty. No, it's not a novelty, it's a very good idea. Well, there we are. So now, the entirety of my life is placed back in this drawer, and then you will see the uh, essence of me. We go, and I'll be gone. Oh, I said the entirety of my life. There's more. And that's part of, I think, the importance of reading and all of these books that are around us. Uh, the fact that the more you read, the more every single street becomes thick. The air almost becomes viscous. And this is just, this is news of what happens in our village, which is generally reasonably banal. There's one that just, the headline says, did fairies cut the local hedge? <laughs> but it, it turned out it was a gardener. And uh, in fact, that's revealed in the first, the first line. You think, oh, how long are they gonna keep us hanging? No, the Bucks examiner very quickly uh, show, but, uh, this is a story that became national news, including The Sun, and it is no posh people, uh, sorry, no common people in my graveyard, 
says Vicar. And this was because our, 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 our vicar, Bob Stapledon, wouldn't, didn't want to give up his orchard to be turned into more space for graves. But he said the Duke of Bedford could be buried there. Yeah. And, uh, and my dad is actually quoted as saying that, uh, where are we? Uh, local councillor Nigel Ince says that there should be space for everyone here. It is vital, not just for the Duke of Bedford. And he was actually rung up by the Telegraph for his opinion at midnight. And uh, that was, I think, the third time I heard him say, fuck off. So, um, <laughs> this is, ah, here we are. Well, this, this one, this is a book that definitely goes to me. Boris Karloff. We both enjoyed watching Boris Karloff films together. I was uh, obsessed with Boris Karloff as a child. And uh, I, I still have a letter from his wife that hangs on my wall. There is the, the film The Dirty Dozen. I don't know if you've ever uh, seen the, Lee Marvin, Ernest Borgnine, uh, Charles Bronson, Telly Savalas. That was filmed in Cheney's. And, uh, and there's a great story, again, a national news story. It was in the Chronicle, it was in the Mirror, and it is about the road sweeper Walter, who was furious that Clint Walker from TV's Cheyenne and other stars had driven their tanks in an unruly manner and made The Verge muddier than it should be, right? Dirty dozen men anger tidy village, right? <laughs> Only 10 years before, we'd won the best kept village and now Lee Marvin was all over the shop in a Jeep, right? But the interesting, one of the things as well, Walter was, when I was born, because it was still, when I was born, this was still like a village. There still was village life. And he, he made a wheelbarrow for me. He, he, uh, and, um, and then later on, he was run over by a hit and run driver. Um, and he actually lost a leg. And, and my dad went to visit him because he, he always believed in, you know, making sure that everyone, you know, it, it was that kind of, you know, rules of, of, of how you treated people. And the thing he couldn't believe was because Walter always wore this flat cap. And then he saw Walter in bed and he didn't have his cap on. And he came back and he was astonished. He went, I can't believe it. Walter has the most incredible hair, head of golden hair. And, uh, and that was the kind of, a, but I just... Yeah, all, it's, it's a wonderful thing, again, to see all of these village characters and the kind of, uh, the things that they, that they represented. This is very interesting. I'd, I'd not, because, uh, oh, look at this. The Starry Heavens. So that was given to my dad when he was 10 years old for Christmas, 25th of the 12th, 1940. And uh, learning to observe See, this is why you can see how hard it is that, you know, the, the idea, especially because these books are small as well. This is, there we go. Have a look at that. There's the, the Daylight Comet, 21st of January, 1910. He loved Quentin Blake. And uh, we went to see a Quentin Blake exhibition and the joy of just going around where he'd look so closely at everything, looking for every tiny detail, every tiny extra bit of beauty. And I remember we walked into a room where Michael Rosen wrote a very beautiful book called The Sad Book. And it was about the loss of his son. His son died when he was in his late teens. And it was the original manuscript that, Quint that uh, Michael Rosen had written. And then it was just the words, uh, the, the, the sketches of Quentin Blake all around the room. And I remember looking at those things and seeing how much my dad would just, the mixture of, of inquisitiveness and also immersiveness in that beauty. And at one point, there's something that has always stayed with me, which is there's a line where Michael Rosen wrote, I loved my son very, very, very much, but he died anyway. And the way that that beauty struck us and the way that that sentence struck us and again I feel such good fortune to have been brought up in an environment where I could keep my mind as open as possible and I could be drawn to so many different things. The Living Countryside which I think I collected or one of these you know buy it every single week it will oh, oh fantastic what's the first one I opened just by chance survival strategies of crabs I of course one of the big bibliomaniac differences between my dad and me is my dad never collected any of Guy N. Smith's giant killer crab books. He didn't get Crabs on the Rampage, Crabs Moon, Night of the Crabs, Origin of the Crabs, uh, none of those. I th this is a uh, 100 are open, 100 inns mainly in West Cornwall, which I just really, and 
I presume this book, I, I, I think the reason that they kept this book is I think, I don't know if I'm right, but I think this was the book they might have taken on their honeymoon because they went down to Cornwall for their honeymoon. And, and I was just, I've never read it before, but it's just uh, fantastic. This guy writes in such a kind of nonchalant manner, almost like he didn't really want, basically he wanted to drink heavily and uh, he wanted some kind of alibi for his heavy, heavy drinking. And... Uh, he said, uh, this is a guide to 100 pubs, predominantly in West Cornwall. To be honest, there's probably 100 pubs as good as this in West Cornwall, but these are the ones that I found. He's put no, no effort in whatsoever. And then one of them, he says, the Plough in Camborne. This is a good pub, but frankly, at times, it was a bit unruly, though I feel that was mainly my fault. So, uh... I mean, books also that when you look them up online, barely exist. This is called Foot Slogger. Okay, I won't keep you forever. Um, I can though, I really could keep you forever. Um, oh, I was gonna start with my dad's children's book, so let's move on to the beginning. Um, now this is very poor, what I've just found. My dad generally looked after books very well, but here I've found this copy of House at Pooh Corner, and look, Nigel, Nigel, you never used to write on your books. And I've got this, this was one thing that I, I, I said to someone the other day, very, very lucky because when he died, there was no kind of unfinished business really for us. And uh, the only unfinished business that was infuriating was he had spent the last five years blaming me for drinking a bottle of slow gin because he could not find it anywhere. And he believed I had taken it to the top of the garden and drunk it all. Well, what did I find the day after he died? That bloody bottle of slow gin. <laughs> And if there is an afterlife, he's putting around rumours about me, which are frankly unfair. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we did when, when uh, in the last 24 hours of his life was we read bits of books to him as well. In fact, I've got here this again from the shop. Uh, his favourite book was Tarka the Otter. So we sat around and we read Tarka the Otter. He, he has so many copies of Tarka the Otter. Right, inside this cabinet here is, I would say, my dad's favourite author. Um, and I'll just open this up here to give you a sense of. Um, so, all of these books are by Henry Williamson, who is most famous for Tarka the Otter. And I'll see how many Tarka the Otter. So there's a Tarka the Otter there, Tarka the Otter there. There's a, a compilation with Tarka the Otter there. There's a 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 Tarka the Otter there. Uh, I think somewhere up there's a Tarka the Otter, Sailor the Salmon there, and uh, and so yeah, it's just like this. This was his, in my memories of of going around book fairs with him, in uh, in the nineteen eighties. That's what he would be looking for. He was always and and Henry Williamson. I mean, it, it's not that his books are are worth an enormous amount of money. Uh, it's it was just about having all of them and just uh, so this one here. This copy, which is the first one I remember as a kid, um, The Animal Saga. So this one, I'm not sure when this came out at McDonald's here. And uh, this is uh, what we read when we were in hospital uh, with him. Just to be able to sit there and read when someone can't respond and you don't quite know where their mind is, but you're all together and you're all sharing in a story, a story which you know meant so much to them. Just things like that. Uh, there was no more yicky yackering then they had had fed. They had finally fed, and so the yicky yakkering was over. When Tarka had drunk some water, he snapped playfully at the cub's head, and inviting her by his manner to catch him, jumped through into the shallow of the pool, and then started to chase the moon. And uh, this... I did a very, very cruel thing to my niece, which is, uh, I gave it to her first of all, Francesca, to start reading. And what I didn't tell her was, this is the introduction, and it just goes on and on and on, and has details that just really aren't suitable. Um, and then eventually I went, oh, by the way, that's not actually the book. And then we started with, uh, it's, such, it's such a, a lot of people know it from the movie, Twilight Upon Meadow and Water, the eve star shining above the hill, and old Nog the Heron crying, crack, as his slow, dark wings carried him down to the estuary a whiteness drifting above the sere reeds of the riverside, for the owl had flown from under the middle arch of the stone bridge that once carried the canal across the river. Below Canal Bridge, on the right bank, grew twelve great trees, and roots awash, 
and it's just it's a lovely it's a beautiful nature book if you can if it's possible creating any form of ritual is a good thing to do creating any form of story is a good thing to do because stories are things we can keep revisiting and so we read him Tark of the Otter and uh, my son read him a bit of The Hobbit as well which was a book he had as a child and he always loved that as well uh, and this is probably one of the most precious books and one I barely want to touch and that's his childhood copy of The Hobbit from 1937 and uh, he gave that to me and said now ah, you need to have this now and uh, and my son is now reading not this version but uh, reading another uh, a paperback copy of The Hobbit because he was an enormous fan of The Hobbit. It was like, I, I think that was like his transitionary book. That was the book that uh, when he was a child he read that and he just thought this is the most wonderful place that you can go in terms of literature. Didn't like Lord of the Rings though, just so you know. Oh, the river is flowing, oh tra-la-la-la-la. Uh, the Scandaroon, a story of a Norfolk farm. These, this is where uh, I would say the, the most of him is. This is probably the, the, the proudest uh, in terms of the books that he has. What's that one? That's, oh, another talk of the Otter there as well. I, I was uh, visiting Stuart Lee the other day when I was up doing the Stoke Newton Literary Festival and I saw that Stuart Lee had a few Henry Williamson books and I said, uh, do you want any more uh, Henry Williamson books? And he went, oh no, I think I've got all the ones I need. And you know, he was, he was a Nazi as well. He was quite a Nazi, wasn't he? And I said, well, I think he might have been one of those kind of people in the 1930s who went, well, I think Hitler's doing rather a super job and then may well have changed their mind. And then the next day, popping back to my dad's house, I found these, Henry Williamson Letters and Manuscripts, which I'd never known that he had. And, uh, and I just opened them. And the first letter that I found in the Henry Williamson Letters and Manuscripts was this letter from well-known British fascist Oswald Mosley from 1953. Uh, my dear Henry, many thanks indeed for your letter with your kind offer for European, which we accept with gratitude. It is very much too long since we met. I may be able to look you up in England in the autumn. Meantime, if you're ever in Ireland or on the continent, let us know. Yours ever. Uh, and I think he must have called himself Kit every now and again. Anyway, Oswald Mosley. So, Stuart, maybe Henry Williamson was not as reformed as I'd imagined. When you hunt the Bellstone Fox, you hunt his way. Eric Porter, Jeremy Kemp, Bill Travers, Rachel Roberts, and Dennis Waterman. Um, and uh, I found that in a bookshop uh, called um, Tills, just off the meadows in Edinburgh. Uh, the guy who ran it used to have a huge central table just filled with movie posts. And I thought, oh my God, that's the movie post of the first film I ever saw. And, uh, and I showed it to my dad and he thought it was a gift, so I couldn't say anything about it. And the next thing I knew is uh, he'd had it framed and, uh, and it was his. So there we are. I was only four years old when I went to see it and it ends with this huntsman in a cave suddenly dying from a heart attack and of course when you're four years old just seeing someone holding a knife and about to kill a fox and then going Aah! and then just dying was very inexplicable and so that's how I found out about heart attacks at four years old was watching an animal movie yeah and so everything strange about me since then is entirely because of that the Gerrard's Cross Cinema I saw it at the Gerrard's Cross Cinema which some of you might know from uh, Carry On Camping. That's where uh, Sid and Bernard go to watch a naturist movie. So it's all, there's a rich history, a rich history here. I was mentioning, as well, oh, this is another important, sorry, I've not talked about this, but it was an, it's an important part of the story. An important part of the story, it's something that, um, this book that uh, is, is coming out soon, I'm a joke and so are you. It's an old book actually that I wrote uh, about four years ago, but I, I wrote um, 10,000 extra words for it. And then at the last minute, there's 800 extra words because I finished writing the update uh, the weekend before uh, Dad died. And then when he died, I knew there was something I could add because there are certain things that I didn't put in the book because I was worried they might embarrass him because they were positive things, you know, that whole kind of thing. And, and so uh, the story that I'm going to tell you a little bit about is that when in 1972 on, uh, on the road just down between Chesham and Latimer, uh, what would it have been? Was it about February the 16th? Was it February the 15th? Something like that, about five days before. Uh, by the way, I'm not expecting most of you to know. I was very much, I, that was pointed towards my two sisters. It's not like, hang on a minute, how come none of you know about this? This made the Bucks examiner, right? So on, on that day, we had a very short car journey at the end of the day, two and a half miles, I would say it was. 
And unfortunately on that car journey, my mum was driving the car and there was a car that was overtaking at speed, which crashed into us. And uh, it injured my mum very, very badly. And she had to go to hospital. Uh, she was in a coma. And in fact, she would have died apart from the fact that my dad uh, was really forthright with it. He was fortunately in the car behind. And when the ambulance men said, we're just going to go to the local Amersham hospital, uh, he said, you can't. She has to go to Mount Vernon Hospital. She'll die otherwise. And years later, a doctor said, if you had not made them go there, she would have died. And so it was a big change in our lives. And I think both of us, both my sisters and me, I, I, I think it's almost in middle age that we realised how much changed. And because uh, when things are happening, when you're just when they're just going on, sometimes it requires a distance away before you start noticing, you know, the further away you get, the sharper in focus it can become. And uh, there's various things I want to tell you about this. One of the things is, is this. This is, so mum was in a coma for a while. When she came out of the coma, she was not well at all. She then also suffered uh, her mental health a great deal and, uh, and, and depression and, and other things. And uh, in fact, someone once said to my dad, and he couldn't believe this, someone once said, Nigel, do you know that most men in that situation leave their wives. And I just remember my dad finding that idea just preposterous that he would have left her. How to Stay Married by Jilly Cooper. It's a very 1970s, but let's, let's see how you do stay married. Uh, uh, hotly pursued office relationships. A husband spends far more of his waking life with his secretary and the people he works with than with his wife. It's the same for his wife if she goes out to work. It's very easy to get crushes on people you work with as natural proximity. Actually, my dad's uh, secretary, when he, when he worked in, in business, um, was a naturist. And uh, he would often come home and go, oh dear. She came into the office after having one of her holidays and insisted we look at her photos. And I really don't think he did enjoy looking at her photos. Uh, I really think he was, uh, oh, there I am, Nigel. On the yes, yes, thank you very much, thank you very much. Um, and uh, one of the things that was found in the last few weeks after he died was this letter, which shows that my dad took the time to write to the ambulance men. So he's dealing with all of those things. He's dealing with us three children. He's dealing with my mum, who's severely injured. And he took time to write a letter that was so lovely, obviously. This is the letter from the ambulance men back. Dear Mr Ince, on behalf of myself and D-R-V-N-T-O Smith, I write to thank you for your very kind letter. We seldom receive letters like yours, and it is with some pride that we have been showing it to our other ambulance men. We are the envy of the ambulance station. That to me, again, this is this importance of writing, this importance of connection, this importance of, you know, for us, sometimes people that we forget about, sometimes the ones that, you know, that, that just that little letter for them meant something enormous and also showed so much about him. And then, then there was one that Sarah had found the other day, and this must have been my mum sent a letter to the plastic surgeons uh, who dealt with it. And, and again, this is just, uh, dear Mrs Ince, I thank you for your letter on the 26th of October, 1974. So that was about a year and a half afterwards. Uh, letters like this are always welcome. I am glad to know that you are in a reasonable condition after you had such a severe accident. So, you know, she took the time. And that's a reminder, again, in a world where so much of, I think, our mass media celebrates selfishness because they want you, you know, that thing that when you see certain people on programmes, you know, that, that kind of Katie Hopkins style where they go, well, I'm just saying what everyone else is thinking because they can't imagine that other people don't think like them. You know, one of the things that I find doing, you know, I've probably done about 80 bookshop and library events so far this year. And the one, one of the areas, one of the groups of people that I think are most underrepresented in our mass media are the kind people. Because I meet kind people all the time. I meet 93 year olds and I meet 12 year olds and all of them, what they want to offer and their curiosity and their delight and all of those things are so important. And I think, again, these are some of the things that, that we have found finding these pieces of writing. The, the nice thing that's just happened is uh, someone uh, in, in the village uh, where, my, uh, where my dad spent most of his life uh, has just handed this to my sister. Uh, popped down to a bookshop and found... And this, weirdly enough, I think, it must be about the only version of Tark of the Otter my dad didn't have. And now we've even got this, the beautiful old penguin, and it's got... Uh, the What you were meant to do was... Uh, where, where has it gone? Somewhere here is the bookmark as well, which is... Uh, where's it gone? There we are. There you go. So there we go. Little Henry Williamson 
bookmark. I shall put that in the bookmark collection. For a lot of bookmarks. This is another thing, by the way, on these shelves is how many people need a badger skull? Because we've got quite a collection. And uh, there's, I don't know where all the badger skulls came from, but I've uh, got badger skull. I think that's a fox's skull. Various bird skulls. The, uh, he is left a lot behind, as you've just heard there, from the generations down there with their, their stories and their poems. Uh, he has left a lot of memories, a lot of thoughts, a lot of ethics, a lot of ideas, uh, an enormous number of stuffed owls as well. If anyone here is a fan of taxidermy, we've got at least five stuffed owls. Um, we've also got this stoat available as well. It's not for sale later on. Um, um, and uh, so this this was uh, the Monday. Dad died on the Sunday and this was the Monday and I was glad that I was able to add. There's a couple of things that I was glad that I could add into this book. One of them was I wrote about the car crash and I wrote about the fact that one of the things was because I was only I wasn't even quite three years old. I thought the car crash was my fault because when you're very little, you will probably remember this. Sometimes you might do something like pull a book from a shelf. And then if a pot suddenly falls from across the room, you think you've caused that even though it was nothing to do with you. You feel that you are, you have more control of the world and you might be destroying things. You sometimes blame yourself. And, and, and so I wrote a little bit about that realisation of the fact that I thought because I was behind the passenger seat looking for my little toy gun, that somehow that had caused the crash, not the man who was on the wrong side of the road driving at speed. And my dad read about that and he rang me up and I knew he had something to say. Uh, and there was something he was kind of holding back. And eventually uh, he just said, I wish you told me that you thought it was your fault, because then I could have done something about it. But of course, he couldn't have done. And I said, you couldn't have done anything. There was nothing you'd have been able to do, and you did nothing wrong. And so I was able, first of all, to put that in the book, to put in that extra bit of the story. And then, as I said, I've not read this since uh, since I wrote it, but this is the thing that I put at the end of, uh, of I'm a Joke and So Are You. The day this updated edition was ready to go to press, my dad died. He passed away peacefully in Stoke Mandeville Hospital with two children and four grandchildren sat around him and family from Australia perched on the windowsill, joining him via WhatsApp. We were jovially bickering and joking and reading in passages from Tark of the Otter and the Hobbit as his breath became less and less until there was no more. Stoke Mandeville is also the hospital where my son was born and the one that played a great part in my mother's recovery following the car crash. After my dad died, Jasmine, one of the many friendly medical staff who were brilliant in those last few days, said it was lovely to see so many people around him, as people often die alone, the family detached, only reuniting for the will reading. It's sad to hear that it is unusual in some hospitals for a family to surround a dying relative with love. That is why I'm adding these few words to the end of the book. I was not entirely honest when I wrote down about my father before. I skipped on details because it might have embarrassed him, but his cheeks can't blush anymore, so now I can tell you. The longer he lived, the rarer, the, the, the rarer we realised he was, as we came to understand more of his story, in particular the strength he showed in supporting our mother. Our mother was changed by the accident. The person who went into the hospital struggling for life was not the person who came out. She had many battles with her mental health, and there were frequent moments of confrontation that arose directly because of her injuries, physical and mental. Sometimes this could frustrate him a great deal. Her personality was changed, but he was always there to support her. A doctor once told us that many men left their partners at times such as these, but he was not many men. The values our family share of being supportive, of being there, of trying to treat everyone fairly and with kindness were his values. He turned down career promotion because he believed it would take away too much of his family time. We all argued with him on occasion. We didn't always see eye to eye, but we always knew that we loved each other, even if actually saying those words was sometimes something that could just not happen. We didn't show love by saying it. We all showed love through actions. My mother too showed incredible resilience. She battled with depression that was brought on by the crash. At one point, things had become so bad with her mental health and behavior that our doctor, Dr. Weber, said that she may well have to be sectioned. Yet somehow she found a way of pulling herself together. And I don't mean that in the old English Noel Coward talking to an anxious submariner in a war movie, come on, pull yourself together way. I really mean that she had been so fragmented by her experience that it took incredible strength to make herself whole again. 
When many years later a doctor saw her brain scan, he was amazed that she'd made any sort of recovery, considering the damage. The reason both my mother and my father were surrounded by us when they were dying was because of the values we took from them and that unspoken but visible love. That accident may have changed us all, but it could have been so much worse. We are those lucky ones who survived, not despite our parents, but because of them. Thank you. Oh, there we go. We should end on that. I think that's the, the earliest photo that I know I've had. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope that connected with you. Uh, one of the things that my dad always used to say to me was, but how on earth do you make a living doing this cosmic shambles.com thing? And I said, oh, we don't really make a living from it, but hopefully we get enough money from uh, patreon.com to keep making things. And I remember his last words. His last words were, I do hope everyone donates to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles if you make a documentary about my books. Look, he didn't say that, and I'm using the death of my father as a mercenary way of saying, please support us at patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. It's what he would have wanted. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, even if you haven't enjoyed it, I still think you should support us at patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. So, and also, by the way, click and subscribe. That's what they say, don't they? I'm 55 and I'm having to say click and subscribe. I mean, just for the loss of dignity, you should click and subscribe.